Now, this week, Parliament voted, of course, to approve the Prime Minister's timetable for Brexit. Theresa May plans to trigger Article 50, as you know, by the end of March next year. Well, only 90 MPs voted against that motion, of which only one was Conservative, and he was, of course, Ken Clark. Well, he joins me now from Nottingham, and a very good morning to you, Mr Clark. And, Mr good Clark, morning. just let me ask you this. Is there part of you that feels the UK might not actually, in the end, leave the EU? Well, I think politically it's fairly obvious that, uh, like Andy Burnham, people have had a kind of conversion like St Paul on the way to Damascus. So they're now converted to the idea of uh, change, which they were resisting before. And I, I think I'm resigned to the fact that Parliament is going to vote to leave the European Union. Uh, the most important thing is uh, what are we going to do next? Uh, what are we going to do instead? And the main point of that debate and the main point of my vote, apart from the fact that I'd be a terrible hypocrite if I voted on the basis that I thought it was in British interest to leave the European Union. I don't. Uh, but what is most important, that when the government's got a policy on what it proposes to do in our relationships with Europe and, and the rest of the world, uh, they should put a white paper before Parliament, they should seek a vote. The, the, the July, June the 23rd referendum uh, didn't announce the end of parliamentary democracy. We don't have a dictatorship in this country of the executive. We do have accountability to the people's elected representatives. And then those representatives who've given their views at the last election, if they want to be re-elected, uh, defend the judgments they've exercised whilst they've been in Parliament. Do you think uh, that the timetable, though, will be the one that Theresa May at this point envisages? There are an awful lot of spanners, legal spanners, being thrown into the works. We know about the Article 50 decision coming imminently from the Supreme Court. Now we're here today uh, about another potential challenge about leaving the single market in the European economic area. Well, I'll leave the uh, legal issues, the constitutional issues, to the courts. I'm pretty confident uh, the courts will uphold parliamentary democracy, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about the arguments being put forward by Mr Wilding and others in this latest action. What matters in the end, we have a political democracy. Uh, and what matters in the end is what the majority of people in Parliament are prepared to approve uh, when the government puts before it a strategy, uh, uh, what are the objectives? Are we staying in the single market? Are we staying in the customs union? Do we object to people coming from Europe taking jobs that we can't otherwise fill, sometimes with skills we haven't trained enough people for, uh, so long as they live lawfully here? Uh, once we've got a policy, then we can move on. Uh, but the, the, the timetable's tight. Already, more than half the time between June the 23rd and the end of March has gone. And there's some very big issues which not only has the government not announced a policy, it's quite obvious, it's extremely difficult, they're starting from scratch and they're going to be hard pressed to uh, have a, a sufficiently thought through policy by the end of March to have anything very sensible to put before the other European countries. And what's your analysis of how Theresa May, the Prime Minister, is handling this, and in particular handling the divisions within the Conservative Party? We saw at the, the conference that tough speech she made about Brexit and its effect on the pound. Is that to position herself so she's trusted by those that are more keen on a hard Brexit, or do you think that she secretly believes it? Well, I think, obviously, she was surprised, like everybody else, that the government fell, that she formed a new government in July. Uh, she found herself prime minister uh, long before probably she hoped to be prime minister. She had perfectly reasonable hopes of being prime minister. And she has a blank sheet of paper in front of her, which she's now got to agree with the new cabinet she's formed. And they've got an enormous range of views. Uh, this mess isn't Theresa's fault. I'm quite prepared to give her a chance. She's a tough lady, and we're going to need a tough lady uh, in charge. But but uh, in the end, what matters, how far her government is capable of getting its head around all this and what it's going to put forward, first to Parliament and the British people, about what our overall aims are uh, when we start this negotiation. Uh, and then years of negotiation are going to take place before every aspect of our European membership has been reviewed. Because in all sorts of areas of policy, not just trade and the economy, uh, our, our own policies have interacted with those of the European Union for more than 40 years. 
And a quick thought, uh, Mr Clark, about one of the few posts you never did hold in government, uh, about the Foreign Secretary, about Boris Johnson. Uh, how do you feel about him and his deft diplomatic touch or lack thereof? Well, actually, I thought what Boris said about uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, I rather agree with. And I, I hope the government are consulting their lawyers very closely uh, about uh, how much longer we can uh, you know, carry on without querying some of the things the Saudis are doing in the Middle East uh, whilst we're supplying them with weapons. Uh, that's a serious point. I mean, throughout the referendum campaign, it was all the Boris and Dave uh, uh, show as far as the national media were concerned. And Boris's personality is always going to emerge, and he's different in his style as a foreign secretary. But I think the criticisms are pretty silly, and they're just a bit of light relief, really, from the serious issues, which I hope Boris, who's a very intelligent man, is engaged with as closely as Theresa May. And I would point out, I don't like Andy going on about uh, free movement of Labour sounding a bit like a paler version of Nigel Farage. Boris has never been anti-immigrant. Boris does realise that the economic interests of Britain are helped if we have free access to the biggest open market in the world. Uh, Boris won't argue he's in favour of free trade, but he's in favour of pulling out of a market of 500 million people. So I look forward in the real world to Boris making a positive contribution to discussions inside the government and with the governments we're going to have to deal with. And just finally, a question about the B word. I'm not going to use it on a Sunday morning uh, programme. Back in the 90s, John Major used that word to describe some of those who are making his life difficult within the Conservative Party. It's now been used against you, Mr Clark. Well, the tone of politics has really been damaged by the referendum. So, fortunately, I don't have anything to do with the social media. And my office tell me that the favourable ones from relieved Remainers, citing somebody still sticking to his principles, do outnumber the extraordinary abuse uh, sad people hurl on anybody they uh, disagree with now. Uh, I, I don't often vote against my party. I haven't over the years. Uh, my views are, have been those of the Conservative Party, uh, my pro-European views. That's been mainstream Conservative policy for the last 50 years throughout my political activities, my adult life. Apparently, they changed on the 23rd of June. But until I know what the new policies are, I shall stick to my principles. When I know what the new policies are, I shall make the best judgment of them I can. Ken Clark, thank you very much indeed. Good talking to you, Ken Clark, there in Nottingham.